Hello and welcome to another episode of the Daily Remedy Podcast. Today we're here with Dr. Dyke Drummond, a Mayo-trained family practitioner, physician, burnout survivor, executive coach, and founder of the HappyMD.com. He teaches simple methods to lower stress, build more life balance, and more ideal practice. These tools were discovered and tested via Dr. Drummond's 3,000 hours of physician coaching expertise. Since 2010, he has also delivered live burnout presentations and prevention training to over 40,000 physicians on behalf of 175 corporate and association clients on four continents. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Drummond. Hey, great to be here. <laughs> so, you know, Dr. Drummond, let's begin with the question that you typically get quite a bit, and that is, how did you end up on this career path in helping physicians with burnout? Well, um, I grew up in a situation where, and this is common for a lot of different doctors, my family's story was that I was going to be a doctor. In my case, it goes back three generations. So my mother's mother in the 1930s went to the University of Illinois and left town wanting to be a doctor, but came back a teacher, which was a very acceptable profession for a woman at the time. If she had become a doctor, she would have been one of the very first female doctors in the state of Illinois. Wow. My mother, her daughter went to school in the 50s, University of Illinois, went off wanting to be a doctor, came back a teacher. Now, both of them were great teachers. Each of them has a school named after them by Grandma and Peoria, my mom in Michigan. Okay, so honorable careers as helpers and teachers and doctors have a lot in common when it comes to our mission to make a difference. But I was the firstborn grandchild and a boy. So it was Almost it wasn't it wasn't spoken out loud, but the mission in my family for me was to fulfill that multi generation urge to have a doctor in the family. And I mm -hmm. wasn't aware of that because my family wasn't really verbal about it. But when I got to be a senior in college at Indiana University, I thought to myself, okay, I've got this BS honors biology degree with a four point, right? And I and I said, What am I gonna do? And looking around me at the time, all you had as a a BS in biology was masters in biology. And those people were all lab rats. And I couldn't imagine living in a laboratory doing a restriction enzyme work with DNA. So I looked at my degree and I said, oh my gosh, you know, this is a really good pre-med degree. So maybe I'll apply to some medical schools and see if I get in somewhere. And my whole thought process at the time was, if I'm going to be a doctor, there's only one kind of doctor I want to be. I want to be Dr. Schmidt, who was my family doc growing up. And he was one of those Norman Rockwell kind of family docs with, you know, the picture of the kid on the chair with his mm -hmm. pants pulled down, going to get the image exactly like that. So me, I was a full service family doc from the moment I said I was going to do this. Now, it was partially a family dream, but I loved everything about being a doctor. I loved solving mysteries, which is the first half of any physician encounter, especially in primary care. I loved getting an answer from disparate clues that were confusing if you didn't couldn't talk to the patient and the family. And then I love the second half of a patient encounter with a primary care doc, which is teaching, teaching people what the diagnosis is, why it causes that, that symptom, what you can do to help speed your healing. So I loved all of those interactions until I didn't. And this happened in my 40s, when I turned 40 in the year 2000. I had been a full service family doctor in a little town in Washington state for 10 years and a member of the uh, leadership team. I was the executive committee chairperson of a 40 doctor multi-specialty group because I've always played a leadership role wherever I've been. And as a family doc, one of the things that's really important is that you see things you've never seen before with regularity. It's like, because mm -hmm. family docs are like this. Oh man, this is fascinating. I've never seen anything like this before. And we think that's good. That's our creative edge. That's learning and that's growing. Now, if I was a specialist and my thought process was, I need to know everything within this box. When I get see something I've never seen before, that can be a little disconcerting. That can be make you uncomfortable that you haven't got it all mastered because specialists look for mastery and primary care doctors look for mystery in relationships. Hmm. And I was 10 years into my career. I'd had 35,000 patient visits. My mother and my grandmother were both dead. And I wasn't seeing anything new except for maybe once a month. And all the gas went out of my career. I can remember the classic phrase in my head. I'm not sure how much longer I can keep going like this. I put in my 
my notice, but they said, hang on a second, you can take a sabbatical. So I took 30 days off and I did a bunch of yoga, shaved my head, didn't do anything about work and prayed that when I went back, that feeling would be gone. It was actually a feeling of choking that I had when I was seeing patients. But that choking feeling returned as soon as I came back from my sabbatical. So I put in my 30 day notice and I basically walked away from my medical career. And if you're listening to me right now and you're thinking the same thing, I'm not sure how much longer I can keep going. I need to chuck this and walk away. Please don't do it. Hmm. That's the exact worst pi way to respond to this crisis because you're going to burn so many bridges. I wouldn't recommend that you walk away. Come find me and let's talk about your options because there's always options available. Then I, uh, I worked in walk-in clinics for several years to earn enough money to support the family. And that was really difficult because I had made a, a vow to leave medicine and I wasn't able to for money reasons. And then my now ex-wife and I created a small business, a training business. And in 2010, this is 10 years after I quit, that business and that marriage went away. I was burnt to the ground for the second time. And I had gotten certified as a coach back in 2000 when I quit practicing medicine. I'm not sure why. It was just a different way of relating to your clients. It's very different than a doctor who gives orders and everybody has to follow them. A coach asks questions and helps the client heal themselves. So I had been certified for a co as a coach for about 10 years. And in 2010, when my marriage went away and I was burnt to the ground for the second time, I decided to try and see if I can make a living as a coach working with doctors who are struggling with burnout and stress. And I started a website called thehappymd.com. And fortunately or otherwise, I've been blessed by being continuously busy. <laughs> because wow. in 2010, the burnout arc started to go vertical. Um, burnout's always been present in doctors ever since the beginning of measurements of burnout. One third of doctors are suffering from at least one symptom of burnout every day. The latest results from the survey in 2021 from the famous Shannon Felt nationwide survey shows a 63% burnout prevalence. And so I've, I've been very busy as an individual coach. And when I see patterns in what's burning people out, when I see patterns in what's helping them recover, I write blog posts that mm. turned into a book. And then because of my positioning on the internet, leaders in organizations that now all of a sudden employ a whole bunch of doctors because back when I was practicing, we did paper charts and we owned our practice. Now nobody's got a paper chart and everybody's an employee. Actually, over 70% of doctors are employees. That has been, those are the two greatest forces in driving this, the up, uptick in burnout. And so we've been busy with individual doctors and then the CEOs and CMOs would call me and say, hey, can you do something to help my doctors not burn out and be happier at work? And so I developed a line of trainings and, and we focus on giving trainings for individual tools for individual doctors to use for their own burnout prevention strategy. And we also teach organizations how to build and deploy a corporate burnout prevention strategy because you got your canary and you got your coal mine. Yeah. The canary and the coal mine each need their own strategy if we're going to do a good job. So no, that's, where, awesome. that's, that's where I am. And COVID squeezed everything. And the biggest thing that's going to happen in 2024, we're recording this at the cusp of 2024. The biggest thing is for the second year in a row in America, 100,000 doctors and nurses are going to retire. Wow. These are, your, these are your senior providers, the most productive ones, the ones that hold the institutional knowledge and hold the wisdom of hundreds of thousands of patients encounters and they're going to walk off into the sunset and you're never going to see them again. Wow. Let's expand on that a little bit because when I looked at some of the product offerings and the courses that you have, I saw a lot of macro trends. So you mentioned the burnout numbers. You mentioned the number of uh, employees, both physicians and nurses that are set to leave in the coming months. But you also talk about side gigs and alternative opportunities as well. Why are macro trends important when you're dealing with one-on-one -on -one physician burnouts? Because if you look, the macro trends are the cause of what you see at the individual level. Mm -hmm. So for instance, one of the key um, experiences of being a physician, especially if you ever practiced and own your own practice and now you're an employee, one of the key psychological influences that really saps your energy is what people typically call a loss of aut autonomy. I don't have the ability to do what I want to do in my practice if I'm an employee. 
my job description and my boss and the institution dictates what I can and cannot do. And I don't have a lot of influence over that. That's a function of being an employee. That's a macro trend. Doctors, the old school primary care doctor who owned their own practice and was both a doctor and a clinician, a team leader and a small business person and an entrepreneur, that age is over. There are still people that are wired like that, but they're very much less common than they were back in the day when I went to medical school. Basically, you had small business, independent primary care doctors all over the country. And uh, people these days prefer to have those things done for them. Operations, hiring and firing, finance, having a building, those kinds of things. You don't see new residency graduates these days wanting to take on those things. So what they do is they take an FTE job description that provides those things so long as they show up and do their clinical work. So that's mm -hmm. a macro that causes the, the individual stress on the doctors. And the thing that's happening in the United States right now, and as a matter of fact, I know this is happening in multiple emergency rooms around the United States. The shortages in the wake of COVID in nurse staffing and the nurse staffing demographics going forward are worse than the doctors. We're going to lose hundreds of thousands of nurses and doctors. The, the shortage projections are enormous. What's happening now is almost every hospital in the country cannot open all their beds because wow. they can't get enough nurses to staff the capacity that they have. What does that mean? What does that mean? Here's a ripple, a macro coming back down, right? What does that mean to the emergency room? What does the emergency room do? They examine and triage patients and they decide who gets admitted to the hospital bed and who doesn't. Well, what if you don't have any hospital beds open because you've got a full 30 or bed capacity unoccupied and can't, you can't put patients in there because there's no nurses. What ends up happening is you have a whole bunch of patients lined up called boarding in the back hallways of the emergency room. Technically, they're inpatients, but they're sitting there on ventilators and everything in the back hallways in the emergency room. They're coding people in the parking lots and the emergency rooms in many large city hospitals look like a miniature evacuation from Afghanistan. Why? It's the ripple tip down effect of not having enough nurses to open all your beds. And it's happening right now all over the United States of America. How does that impact what physicians will have to do? Well, you're going to be dealing with overwhelm. You're going to be dealing with understaffing. It's one of those classic things, right? Yeah. What is burnout? Burnout is when the stress of your practice overwhelms your energy reserves hmm. and it affects everything about the way a doctor practices medicine. It affects your ability to be present with the patient. It affects your ability to mount empathy for the patient's condition. It affects your thought processes, your decision-making, the quality of your hand-eye coordination, everything, right? So we've got situations where the sheer level of work is not matched by and this is the way I usually describe it. The work at hand is not matched by the hands on deck. Yeah. So we've got so much work nice. and so few people that it's literally task overwhelm. And these days, the reason why the burnout is going up is because, and, and you just re recall the last time you were an employee. Yeah. Whenever, whenever your administration, this is, a, this is a common behavior of human organizations. Whenever an administration says, hey, we're going to do a new project and you are part of the project, you and your team are part of the project, do they ever ask you to stop doing something? No. They ask you to do more. Yeah. Well, right now, there's a, there, there's a camel with a whole bunch of packages on its back and they're dropping straws on. And every once in a while, we're at that level, every once in a while, they, all they do is drop a little extra task on and somebody crashes somewhere in the system. Somebody breaks, they go down, they're overwhelmed. That's it, they're out, they walk away, they never come back. Now, we can use that perhaps as a lever to get physician leaders, not physician leaders, leaders of healthcare organizations to care because right now they have to learn how to take better care of their people they have to learn how to give their people a superior employee experience or they aren't going to be able to recruit enough to open their doors. And yeah. I'm going to predict in the next couple of years, you're going to say not just the ERs fail, you're going to see whole sites and organizations fail to open because they can't put enough people on the floor. Wow. 
It's interesting the way you analyze burnout as a ratio. I often look at different trends in healthcare. One of the trends we talked about before we started recording was that of AI. And it seems like the field of medicine and the roles physicians will have to undertake are changing dramatically. But within that framework, you see certain things that will change as well as remain constant about burnout itself. Can you talk about the elements that will stay the same and change and how AI will affect that mix? Well, and this is one of the things that I think the venture capital and angel investor folks, right, are trying to engineer out of medicine. I mean, what does a CEO want? They want a robot doctor. They don't want to have to deal with the fact that the doctors and the patients are humans. They want a robot doctor. Doctor, A robot doctor doesn't need to be paid overtime or benefits or anything like that. So you see a whole bunch of stuff that looks like it's in, in game is a robot doctor. But my question is this, because here's, here's what dooms my generation of doctor. If in the future, the citizens of America will accept a robot doctor as the kind of healthcare they're looking for because all they're really looking for is convenience and an app. They don't, they don't consider a conversation or anybody getting to know them or a human touch or empathy as important at all. What they want is to be able to text, get a text of oxy because they stub their toe. If they think that's adequate, we're doomed because that's what you're going to get. It's going to get dumbed down to whatever people will accept in the future. Right now, what we're dealing with is that patient satisfaction is still a key driver of compensation and not only compensation, but contracting to the extent that patient satisfaction is now still old school because people like me are here saying, hey, I want a doctor that's mine. I want to know their first name. I want them to get to know me. I want them to actually put a stethoscope on my chest when I come in with a cough. If that's the standard going forward, it's going to be tough to establish that robot doctor. But I'm not sure my kids who are in their 30s would feel the same way. And so conversation, it's true that conversation or rather the art of conversation changes over time. But do you feel like there are certain fundamentals about the patient physician relationship that will remain throughout despite the change in technology? If they're given a chance to occur, right? Hmm. So... So in order for there to be a human to human interaction, we have to have two humans in the same place. If it turns out that the systems of the future engineer that out, because let's just be clear, there are certain things about things like telehealth and stuff like that, that are much more convenient than taking time off work, driving downtown, finding a parking place, pretty much you're a half day for a a half day off work. And maybe you got, it's your grandma that you're taking down and you got to haul her in and out of the car with a walker or a wheelchair, stuff like that. It's incredibly inconvenient sometimes to do in-person care. So there's a place for telehealth and things like that. But I think that human to human interaction has an interplay that cannot be reproduced by machines. Mm -hmm. I mean, data in Star Trek Next Generation, you know, whatever, these are the fantasies of what a humanoid robot like might look like, but Industry wants it Mm -hmm. because industry wants to would much rather that it was cyborgs now because of because of the need for food and rest and and the fact that we like things like health insurance and benefits and things like that. That was very fascinating. Let's um, circle back to the actual nuts and bolts of physician burnout and how your work helps specific individuals. Can you talk a little bit about your methodology and how you developed it over the many years? Sure. Absolutely. Well, you can't abstract burnout in doctors from the training process Mm -hmm. because the training process and the self-awareness of the person who goes to medical school. So let's go back to the origin story of a doctor. What's the origin story of a doctor? It's that point in time where all of us who are physicians stood in front of a mirror and made the decision to apply to medical school. <clears throat> now, everybody knows that med- school, medical school isn't something for everyone. So you had to look in the, at yourself in the mirror and say, have I got what it takes? And most people who get into medical school usually have a record of academic achievement and grades that gives them some confidence that maybe they've got what it takes to get into medical school. And there's often a self-evaluation process where you say, This is a significant decision 
And I'm going to go for it because I, I want more than just a job when I graduate from college. I want to be a helper and a healer. I want to make a difference. I want my profession to have meaning. Maybe you have other influences like my multi-generational forces in my family. Maybe it's your parents' dream that you be a doctor because your brother's an anesthesiologist or whatever, right? And you see whole families where all the siblings are doctors or lawyers, right? <clears throat> so there's all sorts of things in play. But that's when you throw the dice. And if you get in, you're about to drop yourself into a seven-year gauntlet, a trial by fire, a survival contest where you will not only be trained to be a clinician in your specialty, but you will be pushed beyond any thought that you might have of how tough it's going to be. It's going to be tougher. And so what you get conditioned to do is follow the rules, stay in line, don't color outside the box, right? Do what you're told. And what you don't realize when you get to the end of that seven years, and it's seven to 14 years, I'm a family doc, so that's four years of medical school, three years of residency, that's seven. What you don't realize is that you have to play by the rules of your faculty throughout the course of this process and stay on the tracks like a little train. But as soon as you get to graduation and you walk through the door, you are free. Why do I say that? Well, here's an old joke that's true. What do, we, what do we call the person who graduates last in their medical school class? MD. Doctor, right? Now, what people forget when they graduate is that they're free. Because as a, as a newly graduated qualified physician, you can do anything anywhere in the world. You're completely free to pick whatever career that you want. And yet what the residency graduates look for is something they've been trained to be great residents. They're looking for somebody else to tell them what to do. And you know what? Corporate America right now is more than happy to do that because you're going to get a job interview and guess what they're going to do? They're going to reach behind themselves and they're going to pull off the rack a boilerplate job description that looks very much like the job description you had as a resident. Now, the question is this. Everybody's different. Everybody has inside of them as a physician a concept that can be awakened that I call an ideal job description. In an ideal world, what would your practice look like? What kind of patients would you be treating, doing what kind of things for what kind of hours and what kind of pay on what kind of team in what kind of organization, where in the world? Now, residents are not taught to think that way. So I have to awaken this, this urge when they come to me because they're burned out because they're trying to fulfill somebody else's job description that has nothing to do with their ideal practice. Because a lot of times what happens is I meet people who are burned out and what they're trying to do is desperately run away from everything they don't like about this job. And what we have to do, we have to have this conversation because this is actually true. I've seen it over and over again. You can avoid everything you don't want and you still won't get what you want because the only way to get what you want in your career is to figure out what that is and go get it. The ideal job description is what would you run towards? And once you identify that, and it takes, because these people are 7, 12, 15, 40 years into their career, and we're waking up an old desire from when they chose to go to medical school in the first place, it takes a while for them to get clear on their ideal job description. But the recovery from burnout is working your way towards that ideal practice. Mm -hmm. getting more of what you really want, what really turns you on about seeing patients in your specialty. Now, there's a lot of people out there who've given up on that being possible. They've been ground down by abusive cultures and bad organizations and bad leaders to think, no, the only way that I can survive is to escape. And so there's a lot of side gig and, um, and escape fantasies out there but the number of doctors who are actually escaping medicine to a completely different career that, by the way, it always has to pay the same as being a doctor or they wouldn't make the jump. That number of people is very small. There's a lot of activity on the Internet about it. A lot of people posturing on social media saying, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But the people who've done it are quite small. I mm -hmm. am a, an example of that escape. I wasn't escaping. I, I backed back into it after having been out of medicine for 10 years. Interesting. How does your own career trajectory reflect those that you've helped? 
going in and out of the medical practice, increasing, decreasing your workload. Does that give you a unique perspective when you're helping other physicians? What I did and the way that I can understand it is 10 years later, I became exactly the person I needed most when I quit in 2000. I've become the person I needed most who would have helped me stay on course to this desire to make a difference, to be a helper and a heather. And what I would have probably done if I think about it, and this is obviously second guessing, but if I had had somebody like me as a coach back in 2000, I would probably have stepped up into a leadership role and still be in active healthcare practice. Hmm. Now, um, what I have though, is the ability to show people through my other business experiences and my other roles and other uh, entrepreneurial ventures in my life to show people how things that seem to be set in stone inside a medical practice for a doctor are not. Are not. There are certain ways that medicine works. There are certain ways that different institutions operate in terms of leadership philosophy and communication and all of that. But it's all it's all just historical. It's so easy. It's so easy to take better care of your people. But healthcare has a blind spot. And the blind spot comes in the form of healthcare's first prime directive. Patient comes first. Both the institutions and the physicians themselves have to learn to put an off switch on that programming. Physicians have to turn off the patient comes first in order for them to recharge their energy levels and go back to work even tomorrow and continue to make a difference. And leaders in healthcare need to understand that their first priority is the health, well being, and engagement of their people. And if they simply take better care of their people, the people will take better care of the patients naturally and automatically. That's what they are programmed and that's what their true desire is to do. Well said. I want to touch back on a few things you had mentioned that I thought are quite interesting. You talk about how physicians are trained to think a certain way to help patients clinically. So in my mind, I see that as their comfort zone, but at some point in the burnout process, that comfort zone becomes quite the opposite. So when you encourage your clients to go outside of their comfort zone, are you asking them to do more of the clinical or to find something outside of the clinical, or is that really very per, per client? It's, it's not about me. Hmm. Just like, see, what you're, what you're doing is potentially, you may be doing this and not notice it, but what you're doing is thinking that I, as a doctor, would prescribe. Hmm. And that's what doctors do. However, as a coach, we don't prescribe. What we do is we ask the questions that allow you to understand yourself deeper. Well and and what, what I do, if when I've got somebody... The first thing I teach people is a breathing technique that allows you to be the eye of the storm at work. We call it the squeegee breath. It's a very simple head to toe breath that you use a trigger for at work. So you're taking these deep breaths and cleaning yourself of any anxiety and, or, or anger or things like that over and over again. And when I meet somebody whose energy is downward spiraling at work and I can teach them how to do this release multiple times a day, their downward spiral stops. At that point, we start working on ideal practice description. And that takes several weeks. You have to be really patient and forgiving with yourself. Because the first thing that you run into when you get clear on what you really want is how you've betrayed that desire along the way. So there's a lot of shame and guilt and other stuff in this change process. And you may feel like you're letting people down if you, for instance, need to go out on a, on a, a, a disability leave. You need to do a sabbatical or something like that. You may, there's all sorts of shame and guilt and stuff that comes up that's, that's a legacy of our medical education. And then what we do is we say, what is that ideal patient of yours? What do you love doing the most? What are the things that turn your crank about your practice? Because everybody that I meet usually falls into a specific criteria. What they'll say is, you know, Dyke, I still love my patients. I still love practicing medicine, but man, I don't like this job. So they still have an inner drive to be able to be a helper and a healer and make a difference like that. And then what we do is we slowly dial in more of what they like. And this is why one of the things that we've had to begin in our practice 
since employee employment status has changed to employee over the years is we have a whole training about how to manage your boss, <laughs> how to build a relationship with your boss so that you can be in a position of having some influence over them. Cause you'll come to some point in your practice. If you're an employee where you actually need your boss to say yes to something you want in order to move it more towards an ideal. And what we're trying to create is a very simple thing. We're trying to create a Venn diagram. And the Venn diagram just has two circles. It's very, very simple. Notice I don't have to make this. It's sitting on my desktop, okay? Mm -hmm. these, are, these are things that I do with all of my clients, right? So on one side is your ideal practice, and on the other side is this practice. And these are Venn diagrams of feelings, right? So even if you don't have your ideal practice completely fleshed out and written down, if I say, you know what your current practice feels like, that's this one, right? And you can imagine what your ideal practice feels like. How much overlap does it feel like there is between these two right now? And I say, yeah. take a breath. Just let your awareness go back over the last couple of weeks. How much overlap does it feel like there is between your current practice and your ideal practice? And what I notice is there's a normal range, right? What feels good? Anything six and above feels pretty darn good. 60%, 60% or above overlap. Anything 40% or below doesn't feel good. And we also ask about trajectory. Is that level of overlap going up or going down as time goes by? If somebody says I'm a 30% overlap and it's going down, you better do something because here's the backstory on burnout. And this is the thing that's the most concerning because burnout in a doctor causes them to question who they are. It's a true identity crisis. If you let them descend into the crisis, if you let them drop to the point where they're ready to jump ship and give it all up, some people, because people are people and doctors are people too, drugs, alcohol, depression, suicide. So if you look at men or women who happen to be doctors, their suicide rate is double that of the non-physician population for that gender. And you want to avoid the crisis. And we run into people all the time who are off work on disability leave, seeing a psychiatrist on medications and a therapist. And in my mind, they still need a coach. Because the way that I differentiate therapy from coaching is therapy is typically looking at what is looking backwards in time. It's like driving a car and looking in the rear view mirror. Therapy is asking about the origin of these symptoms and how did it get this way? Coaching is always relentlessly looking forward and saying, what do you want to have happen? Let's begin to build that. And again, notice I'm asking questions. Well what, do you, said. what do you really want? And this is when desire, the deep desire to align and create harmony between who you feel that you are and who, what you feel your mission is and your day-to-day -day reality, when that is fractured, that's when we get burnout. Mm -hmm. And in, 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 in any career where you feel a very strong affinity with your people. So doctors for patients, teachers for their pupils. Are you with me? Therapists for their clients. And, and in some cases, even some ethical bankers, right? You can be a financial person and still have that drive, that ethical, moral, soul level drive to serve your people. It's not common, but you can. So anybody mm -hmm. who cares about what they do and feels that they're here to make a difference and lead a life of purpose is more susceptible to burnout because of that. Wow. You use the word feel, implying something subjective in nature. I would imagine that when you're working with some of your clients, there's perhaps um, a lack of self-honesty. I'm not sure if I'm phrasing it the right way, but I'm sure you understand where I'm coming toward a lack of self-accountability or lack of willingness to be honest with oneself. And when you have that, how do you discern what those feelings are, the real from the imaginary, what the true source of burnout versus the presentation they're trying to create? Yeah, and what I'll say is that you are making a classic error in the way you're phrasing that, and the error is implying consciousness. 
Hmm. So I want you to know that in seven years <clears throat> of, and it's, it's much different now because in 2003, 2004, we, in, we instigated, um, we put in place residency work hour restrictions so that residents cannot be pushed as hard now as they were back in the day when I was in school. I can remember working a 127 hour week pediatric ICU when I was a resident. That's not legal anymore. It occasionally happens, but it's not legal anymore. And what ends up happening is it is, it is almost impossible to overestimate how heavily programmed and conditioned doctors are to behave in certain ways. And for instance, here's one. The number one piece of programming that doctors absorb is the conscious first prime directive. I'm the person who calls it a prime directive. Nobody else uses that term. And, the, and it is the patient comes first. And you would acknowledge that. I would acknowledge that. And the man on the street in an interview would acknowledge that. How, what's doctor's main program? The, the patient comes first, right? The patient comes first. Can the patient come first? 24-7, 365, and you have any hope of being normal? And the answer is no. You have to have an off switch, but you're never taught that in medical school. I have to teach that all the time to my clients. The second of the two prime directives is one that a lot of people aren't familiar with, so I'm going to out it here. It's unconscious. It's never spoken, except inside the head of a doctor who's struggling. The second one is never show weakness. Never do anything to make anybody think you haven't got what it takes along the way. And this programming is very interesting. It's the cause of imposter syndrome. What if they find out is another version of what this voice says. What if they find out I'm having trouble? What if they find out that I'm really tired? What if they find out that I need to take a break? Because that weakness is something that you want to avoid at all costs. And the thing about this is that it is also something that has different levels of power depending on you and who you are. Example, it has bias and discrimination aspects to it. So for instance, for me, my, what if they find out never show weakness programming is not as strong perhaps as you because of where you were raised, the language you spoke when you grew up, the color of your skin, the discrimination that's against you here in America, because the medical education system, the healthcare delivery system in our society is riddled with bias and discrimination. And if you're trying to make it through medical school, you have to be even tougher than me because you're going to be more challenged than me by those in place, tilted playing fields that you have to fight against. What's the mm. phrase? A woman has to work twice as hard to be seen as half as good as a man, that kind of yeah. stuff. So that, so the never show weakness program is even stronger in all women anybody who doesn't look like me. And if you can't see me right now, because this is a podcast, I'm a big old white guy. <laughs> so um, that kind of bias in, um, in the education system is least applied to me. Mm. Wow. Well said. So, so when you say a person is having a false or a true symptom of burnout or something like that, you're implying that they have a conscious thought process that is right. asking them, should I acknowledge this or not? When actually they're reacting purely unconsciously knee jerk programming. It's brainwashing, pure and simple. Let me give you an example. We all admit that if I take a bunch of 18 year old recruits and I put them through boot camp, that's a conditioning exercise. One of the things they're being conditioned to do is to follow orders, right? And these are kids that are probably pretty wild back in high school, right? But after basic training, if I tell them to jump out of bed and put their clothes on, they're going to do it, right? I don't even have to be nice about it because it's an order and they have to obey. That's conditioning. Do you know how long basic training is? Six to 13 weeks. Hmm. I just told you, how long is the medical education process? Yeah. Seven, Seven to 14. years. Do you think there's some conditioning going on? Do you think if at any point in time you had ever in your medical education process, you had ever refused to do what was asked of you by an attending, didn't show up on time, had to skip a shift or take a week off, do you think that would affect your ability to survive the training process and graduate with full, full honors? And the answer is yes. The interesting thing too is that there is occasionally in every class somebody who doesn't make it. 
And if you talk to doctors, and I've talked to thousands of them in public trainings when I ask them questions and ask them to raise their hands, everybody knows somebody who quit in medical school. But the interesting thing is we can all see his face or her face. Nobody can remember that person's dead and their name. And the reason is they get ghosted. If, if you have somebody who was in your medical school class and now they're gone, nobody speaks their name ever again. It's as if they were never there. So everybody, mm -hmm. know, everybody remembers that one, but they can't remember their name. And the thing they know is that they don't want to end up falling out. So yeah. That's the one wow. thing they must avoid. Wow. With that, Dr. Roman, thank you so much for your time. I feel as if you're providing a coaching session for me just now. And so <laughs> I'm very grateful for that. For the listening audience, can you provide your information and how they can sure. get a hold of you? Sure. Uh, so my website is The Happy MD. So it's T H E, The Happy MD.com. And I've got a, uh, the Happy MD channel on YouTube. Um, I'm on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook with both my name, Dyke, D I K E, Drummond, D R U M M O N D. And what we've been talking about here today, just to be really clear, is tactics and a process for an individual person to create a more ideal practice, recover from burnout and prevent it in the future by staying on track to that ideal practice, specifically with this Venn diagram. And in addition, because I've always been a leader, I played rugby as a young man, actually 23 year rugby career where I captained all but one team that I played on over the course of that career. Actually, interestingly, at IU when I was an undergrad, one of my nice. second row, one of my second row teammates was a guy named Mark Cuban, who you might recognize if I put his picture up here. Yeah. So we also have a whole line of services that help organizations create a corporate burnout prevention strategy because you need to have a strategy for every canary, that's every doctor. You need to have a strategy for the coal mine if you're gonna build a healthy tribe team organization. So we have both individual and corporate services available. Dyke Drummond, thehappymd.com. Wow. Dr. Drummond, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Happy New Year, everybody. 2024 is going to be a turning point for AI and healthcare, for sure, because I think 2023 was just a taste of what's possible. 2024, we're going to see what works and people are going to run like crazy with it. And 2024 is going to see whether the U.S. healthcare system can handle losing another 100,000 doctors and nurses. And it is touch and go right now.